This is Dr. Ted Hildebrandt in his New Testament History, Literature, and Theology course, lecture number 22, on the book of Acts, the second and third missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. Welcome back. Uh, We're going to hopefully in this next hour complete the book of Acts. Uh, We've been talking so far. We started out with Peter and Paul and early in the book of Acts how the church was started. We talked about uh, Pentecost and Acts chapter 2 and the speaking in tongues and jumped over to 1 Corinthians 14 for uh, speaking in tongues there versus prophecy. And then we uh, got into the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. And we basically traced Paul from Barnabas and John Mark through Cyprus and then Paphos, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, and uh, Paul being beat almost to the point of death, stoned at Lystra, and then coming back. And then after his first missionary journey, we said 50 AD was the date we're trying to remember. 50 AD is the Jerusalem Council. And the Jerusalem Council is critical because that's where the discussion of whether the Gentiles, how the Gentiles are accepted into the church. So first missionary journey comes before the Jerusalem Council, and then Paul then writes possibly the letter to the Galatians telling them Gentiles don't have to be circumcised, and um, and now Paul is going to go on a second missionary journey right after 50 AD. And so we'll wanna, we're will want going to start on the second missionary journey and uh, begin there. Um, first of all, we should say, as the, fr- the second missionary journey uh, launches from Antioch and Syria, where they all start in Antioch and Syria there, uh, Barnabas is with Paul and says, hey, let's go on a second missionary journey. Let's take John Mark and let's go again. Paul says, over my dead body. And basically, Paul and Barnabas have such a riff that Barnabas takes John Mark, and apparently Barnabas and John Mark go back to Cyprus, which was Barnabas' home. And, and then they're out of the picture. That's the last you hear of them. Barnabas is kind of gone. And Paul takes Silas instead. So it's now on second missionary journey. This is after 50 AD, right after that. Paul and Silas set out. And when they set out, this time they go from Antioch, and rather than going to Cyprus, they go up, possibly passing through Tarsus. Tarsus was Paul's home. And going through Tarsus and then back up through and Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch that he had visited on his second, first missionary journey. So the second missionary journey revisits those, those cities. And at Lystra, it's interesting because this place where Paul was stoned made gods in terms of Hermes and Zeus at Lystra because of healing that crippled person. Um, Timothy is actually picked up as a disciple here of the Apostle Paul, comes, comes with Paul as a helper, kind of like John Mark was in the original. But it, notice what it says here. It's very interesting. This is in Acts chapter 16, verse 3. Acts 16, 3 says, So he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area. For they all knew that his father was Greek. Now it's very interesting. The Jerusalem Council had just decided that the Gentiles do not have to be circumcised. But when Paul's at Lystra and picks up Timothy, the first thing he does to Timothy is circumcise him. His father was Greek, his mother was Jewish apparently, and Paul circumcises Timothy. Why did he do that when the Jerusalem Council just the year previous, had made the statement that the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. This is not a circumcision of salvation that Timothy is saved. In other words, he has to be circumcised in order to be saved to become a Christian. No, this is Timothy is circumcised so that he is not offensive to the Jewish people who knew that his mother was Jewish and his father was Greek. So this doesn't have anything to do with salvation. This has more to do with getting along with the people that you're going to be around and things like that. So Timothy is circumcised uh, for expediency purposes, not for salvation or any necessarily big theological um, uh, statement, other than that it is a theological statement to say, hey, we don't want you to be offensive to the people that we're going to be ministering to. So just uh, be circumcised. So Timothy is circumcised at that point. So Timothy now joins him. They go to Antioch, Iconium, and and Antioch, And basically, Paul wants to head over here to Ephesus. Ephesus is in the province of Asia. So Paul wants to go to Asia, the province of Asia, Ephesus. Ephesus is a big city, and Paul wants to hit Ephesus. But instead, it says that the Spirit basically stopped them from going to Asia. And so Paul then makes his way up here to Troas. Troas, up in the north, um, the north here, the west, northwest, 
is up by Tr Troy. You guys have ever heard of Troy? And you have the Iliad and the Odyssey and all that stuff with Homer and Troy. Troy is up there, Troas. And so um, basically what happens at Troas? At Troas, second missionary journey, Lystra, he picks up Timothy. As he goes up to Troas, all of a sudden we get this kind of a statement being made in the book of Acts. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, and now here's the, the one word important thing, after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once. This is Acts chapter 16, verse 10. Acts chapter 16, verse 10, at Troas, is there's the Macedonian call, what they call the Macedonian call, where the man comes in a vision, Paul has a night and says, come over to Macedonia and help us. So Paul knows then that he's supposed to go to Macedonia. But when it's, what the interesting thing is that all of a sudden the we's start here. So this is the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. When he hits Troas, apparently that's where Luke gets on board. So he picks up Timothy at Lystra, and he picks up Luke at Troas, and all of a sudden the we's start that we talked about earlier, the we, we's. Um, that start there. So, um, so Troas is important. He gets this Macedonian call at Troas, and he now is going to go over to Europe for the first European converts at Philippi uh, there. And so you basically have him traveling over to Europe now, away from Asia Minor and Syria and Israel and things. So now what happens when he gets to uh, Philippi? First of all, we notice Philippi is in Macedonia. Macedonia is up here. Uh, who also was from Macedonia? If I say uh, Macedonia, what comes to mind? Hopefully from earlier in the course, you remember Philip of Macedon. Philip of Macedon was Alexander the Great's father. So Philip of Macedon, and there's, so the place Philippi is, most, is named after Philip of Macedon. So they get into Philip, Philippi, and uh, it's interesting here. They go out by the river because there's no synagogue. There's no synagogue in Philippi. What does that tell us? Apparently, there's. Uh, what does it take in order to make a synagogue? Now, in those days, I believe you had to have ten elders, heads of household, in order to make a synagogue. So you had to, in order to make a synagogue, you had ten, you know, heads of households, and there apparently weren't that many Jews there, so they didn't have a synagogue. So they're meeting out by the river, and there's this woman who is converted, and kind of the first European convert. Her name is Lydia. She's a seller of purple uh, from Thyatira. And uh, so she sells purple, which uh, is wealth, uh, wealthy. This is a, this a wealthy woman, a woman of means. And she sells purple, and so it says Lydia is there. And then what happens? Um, I should just kind of, let me just narrate the story. This is from Acts chapter 16, verses 7 and following. I'll just narrate the story. Basically, there's these guys, and these guys have this, this girl who's demon-possessed. And she basically can tell the future. And so basically they work with this girl, and basically they make money off the enslavement of this girl. Basically, she would come and tell people what's going on in the future through this demon and things. Well, this uh, girl comes after Paul and Barnabas, and Paul finally gets, and she's announcing things about Paul and Barnabas. He kind of gets upset a little bit. He turns around and casts the demon out of this girl. So now this girl is worthless to these guys who had used her to make money. And when you hit somebody in the pocketbook, they're going to do something, okay? And so basically, this girl, the demon's cast out of her. She can't tell the future now. And uh, so these guys are out of their job and things. And so basically, they have Paul and Barnabas thrown into prison. Or I'm sorry, Paul and Silas thrown in prison. So Paul is thrown into prison. And then what do they do in prison? Um, basically, they're singing and praising God in prison and things. And uh, when the owners of the slave girls, this is Acts chapter 16, verse 19, when the owners of the slave girl realized that the hope of their making money was gone, they seized Paul and, Barn Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the, face the authorities. Okay. Now, apparently, there's an anti-Jewish bias there. And if you read down a ways, it says, these men are Jews, you know, and, and there's a real negative thing against the Jews. Again, there aren't many Jews there. There's less than ten heads of household there and stuff. These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Remember how we said the early Christians were viewed as atheists 
because they worshipped a god you couldn't see. They were they were rejected as cannibals because they ate the blood of their master and, and ate his body. They were viewed as incestuous because they married their brothers and sisters. And so you can see this kind of uh, misrepresentation. These men are Jews, throwing our cities into an uproar, advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Okay, so Paul and Barnab Paul and Silas are in prison, and basically they're singing hymns in the middle of the night. And all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord comes down and basically blows open the doors, and their shackles drop off. And Paul and Barnab Paul and Silas are, are going free there. And it just uh, it's interesting to see what happens here. You've got a, a Roman guard. Now, what's the Roman guard going to do? The, the, the prison is open, okay? The prison door is open, and they're stripped and beaten, by the way, on the process, which is interesting. So, suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake, and the foundations of the prisons were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, because he thought the prisoners had escaped. And it, was, it was his responsibility to guard those prisoners. Those prisoners go free and have escaped and stuff. His life, he's dead. And so he's going to kill himself rather than be abused by somebody else, uh, the governor or the, the governmental people and stuff. So what happened is Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. And now this is the classic line. This is chapter 16, verse 30 and following. Chapter 16, verse 30 of following of the book of Acts. He then brought them out and asked, and this is one of the clearest request questions in Scripture, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? They replied, and now you get one of the clearest answers, what must I do to be saved? The guy asked just a straight up, honest, simple question, right to the point. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Okay, One of the clearest statements. Believe, what does it take? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Okay, And this is one of the most clear statements. And it takes place at Philippi, the Philippian jailer. This guy is known as the Philippian jailer. Uh, and we've got to ask then, do other people always try to tag on, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved? But everybody is like, yeah, you got to believe in Jesus, plus you have to do this. you got to believe in Jesus, yes, but you got to do this too. And so everybody's already willing to tag something onto that statement, a belief plus something. And so, for example, I had a, a student friend of mine that got involved with this, uh, was there some cult that basically said you had to be baptized by their church, otherwise you were not baptized. And if you were not baptized, you were not saved. Okay, You needed to be baptized in order to have your sins forgiven you. And what they did is they worked off of Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Let me just read this. That you had to be baptized, otherwise you were not saved. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and it says, Believe and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Believe and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Okay? So that you've got to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. In order for your, sin, in order for your sins to be forgiven. And what they said is, no, no, you can't be baptized by anybody. You have to be baptized by our church. Do you see how cultic that is? You have to be, in other words, anybody else's baptism in any other church is no, not valid. You have to be baptized by our church. So they're the ones who control whether somebody gets into heaven or hell, whatever. They're the ones that control it through their baptism, okay? It's a very cultic orientation. And this uh, student friend of mine got involved with them and actually came back and kind of gave me a lecture that I'm not saved because I haven't been baptized by their church. And his parents weren't saved because they weren't baptized by that church. And so he went off with them kind of just then. And, uh, and then finally, after it was a number of, I don't know, four or five years, he realized finally that this thing was a sham and then basically got out of it. But it's, it's, it's a very cultic practice. You've got to be in our group, otherwise you're not a believer. Uh, you're not a Christian and stuff. And, and a lot of churches try to pull that kind of stuff in a cultic kind of way. Uh, here's another one that I just uh, and I told, mentioned before when we're doing tongue speaking. 
the oneness movement, which says you've got to speak in tongues. It's believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, but you also have to speak in tongues. Otherwise, you're not a real Christian. The Holy Spirit hasn't really come on you and baptized you, and so you speak in tongues. And so you have to speak in tongues in order to, in order to be a Christian. And so this is, kind of, again, it's kind of a, a cultic kind of thing. You've got to do our trick. You've got to do our trick in order to make it into heaven. And Paul says, no, no, you've got to, what, what is it that you need to be saved? You've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. I think one of the best examples, counterexamples to this cultic kind of stuff is, do you remember the thief on the cross? There was, there were two thieves next to Jesus on the cross. And when Jesus was dying, do you remember the one guy said, Lord, remember me when you come into my, into your kingdom? Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today, you will be with me in paradise. Was the guy baptized? No. Okay. Was the guy speaking tongues? No. Jesus said today. Why did Jesus say today you will be with me in paradise? He believed in Jesus Christ. He was saved. Okay. And so the thief on the cross did not do any works other than believe in Jesus Christ. That's what it takes. That's what salvation is about. Now, the question comes now, what does belief mean? What does belief, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? What does that actually mean? And I want to kind of lay out three things. These are kind of traditional in the church. There are three things, that basically. First of all, believing requires knowing the facts. You've got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to know who is Jesus Christ, okay? Jesus Christ came, was born of a virgin, uh, lived in Palestine, did many miracles before God and men. Basically, Jesus died for our sins, and he rose again on the third day and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the God, the Father Almighty. From whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. If any of you know the Apostles' Creed, you know those kind of things. Those, that's the essence of the gospel. You need to know those certain facts. Jesus died for our sins. He rose again physically to life and stuff. He ascended into heaven and things. So there's certain facts you've got to know. So the first part of belief is knowing facts. You've got to know who is Jesus. You've got to know who is Jesus. So in order to believe in something, you've got to know something about that something. Okay. The second thing is that you've got to basically accept it as true. It's not enough to just say, I know these facts about Jesus, but you've got to say, I accept these facts that Jesus rose from the dead physically rose from the dead, was seen by 500, was seen by 12, was seen by the two on the road to Emmaus, was seen by Thomas, who doubted, was seen by Paul, okay, later on. In all different circumstances, in various environments, in Jerusalem, in Emmaus, and up in Galilee, all different places with uh, different times of the day, different people, women, men, uh, various uh, contexts. You've got to accept those, those facts are true, and that they're true for you, that Jesus died not just generally, but Jesus died for your sins, and that you're trusting in God for that forgiveness that comes through Christ's great sacrifice on your behalf, what they call the substitutionary atonement, that Christ's death was substitutionary for you. So you believe, you've got to know the facts, and then you've got to accept that those facts are true. And then thirdly, it's what you call trust, and the element of trust. Probably the best way I can illustrate this is when I was a little kid. Uh, what does it mean to trust in something, to believe in it, to the, and, and trust being part of that belief? When I was young, a place called Burkhalls in Niagara Falls, New York, there's a house. It was a very small house, and the roof was fairly flat. And so my father took me up on the roof. I must have been about three years old at the time. And my father, I was up on the roof with my dad. He was fixing some things on the roof. And so I was up there, and my mother was down below. And my father said, jump down to your mother. Jump off the roof, and your mother will catch you. So what I did was I figured, hey, this is going to be really cool. I'm going to be able to like, fly through the air, man. Down to my mother will catch me. So I got back, and I, I got back on the house, and I got back. And then all of a sudden, I started running. So I'm trucking down, and I'm going to basically jump off the roof, and I'm just going to fly, man, and my mother's going to catch me. And this is going to be like, you know, I'm going to be flying, man. And so this is, so I'm back, and I'm three years old. <laughs> so I start racing down the roof to my house. And I'm going to jump off, and, my, and all of a sudden, I get this big hand, this my father, just whoom, 
reached down, grabbed the back of my, my thing, and just basically picked me off the ground. He says, what are you doing? And I said, you said to jump down to mom, so I'm jumping down to mom, man. I was going to fly out there, man, and stuff. And he says, I was just kidding. I didn't mean for you to jump off the roof. Your mother's not going to be able to catch you, you know, and things. And so that was when I learned the first lesson, never trust your father. <laughs> Anyways, uh, but uh, and then that's not the point, okay? The point here is that that was trust. And there was trust is when you give yourself to the facts. And so when you actually, you, you make the leap of faith. You actually entrust yourself to those facts. I know what the facts are. I believe that the facts are true and they're for me. And now I'm going to trust myself to those facts and, 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 and do that. So there's three aspects of faith and those three different kind of ways of looking at it. So to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Not, you don't have to, that's it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Now, question, do works follow from that? And James tells us very clearly in James chapter 2, verse 17 and thereabouts, faith without works is dead. So if a person tells you that they've got faith and then you don't see the reflected in their lives, that's a major problem as well. And so you've got to be very careful with that. And I just, um, let me, while I'm here, to um, mention in terms of believing... And and what that what that means, yeah. Um, one entrusts oneself to what one believes to be true, and it affects then the way one lives. Faith without works is dead, as they say. I uh, tell you a story about a man named Probo. I I worked uh, for ten years in a maximum security prison, Indiana State Prison. I would teach at this place, Grace College, during the day. And then at night, uh, Ken Taylor, a friend of mine, uh, taught at Grace and stuff. We would get in the car and drive for an hour and a half up to this prison. And then we would go in the prison through these seven gates. It was maximum security, 40-foot high walls, about 10-foot thick. It was built in, I think, 1863 or something. It was built right around Civil War time. So this is really old. And it's maximum security. So this is where all the big boys go. You know, life sentences against them, 35 years 25 years, that kind of stuff. Uh, I met a guy in, in the prison. His name was Provo. Uh, his, actually, his name was John. Uh, John, I won't give you his last name, but anyway, his name was Provo in the prison. He was a Vietnam vet. Um, he um, basically, let me just tell you a little bit of the story. This is on tape and we'll go a little longer and stuff, but it just, he was a Vietnam vet. He was uh, trained in special services, and so there was a DMZ, a demilitarized zone in Vietnam. They basically would drop him on the other side of this demilitarized zone where he wasn't supposed to be, okay? So this guy is not, he's not supposed to be there, but they'd drop him in there. And they basically gave him a knife in his hands, and he didn't have a gun. You couldn't have a gun because if you had a gun and you shot, it would make a noise and people would then discover that you're there. So they gave him a knife in his hands and basically trained him how to kill people. And so they dropped him behind the demilitarized zone, and he just went in and killed some of these uh Viet Cong people and things back in those days. When he came back to America, he was a hero. I mean, this guy is uh, very highly trained, very good at what he did. He made it in and out alive, and that's something to be said for that, if you know anything about the Vietnam War. He came back to America. Uh, he was in a bar one night, and two guys jumped him. Well, I'll tell you, you don't want to jump Probo, because uh, this guy is very good at what he did, and he'd done it many times. These two guys jumped him, and after he was a highly decorated military, you know, guy in a parade and highly decorated by America, he's in a bar, these two guys jump him, and he flashes back and boom, he just does what he does because it's just like, it's like reflexes with him. And there it goes, you've got two guys dead next to him. Okay, he killed both of the guys uh, with his hands. He's up now for murder charges and he goes to prison for, I think it was 35 years. He was in prison. He was about 55 uh, when he was in prison. When he when he was let out of prison, he was about 55. I knew him probably from when he was 45 to when he was 55. Uh, Provo, nobody in the prison messed with Provo. Everybody knew what he could do, and it was like, yes, Mr. Provo. Okay, and it tattoos over all his body. He was uh, kind of a Hell's Angels, Harley uh, Davidson type guy, and nobody messed with Provo because they knew what uh, he was up to, and uh, nobody messed with him. Uh, he... Uh, he took my class. He wasn't a Christian. Uh, he took my class, and uh, he was always never take notes. He was an Old Testament class. Never took a note in the class, man. I thought, 
And he would always ask me these questions that were always kind of anti the Bible, like he's trying to disprove the Bible, like, you know, the Bible says that bats are birds, and of course bats aren't birds, and so how can Leviticus, you know, be right and things like that because of the way it, you know, classifies things. And so we, and he had a, several other times he confronted me with errors in the Bible and things. And we talked through it, and it was really good. It was good for me, and hopefully it was good for him. Uh, he got out of prison. And I remember seeing fear in his eyes. The first time I ever saw fear in his eyes was when they mentioned he was about 55 at the time, and he knew this guy was very smart. Let me just tell you how smart he was. He never took a note in my Old Testament class. When I gave that test, I thought, okay, Provo, I'm going to make you eat crow now because you're going to take that test. You didn't take any notes, man. You're going to flunk this test. He took the test, got the highest grade in the class. And the problem with Provo is that he had a photographic ear, man, Anything you said, he could like remember it word for word. He could quote me back what I said word for word. I couldn't remember what I said. He could quote it back word for word. The military had trained them that when he got orders, nothing written down, all in his head. The orders were there, boom, he remembered them and stuff, and he could remember. It was incredible what he could remember. Well, when he was going to get out of prison, that was the first time I ever saw fear in his eyes because he knew that he had been in prison for 35 years. And he knew that the world out there had changed. He was a very, very bright man. He was a very bright man. And uh, he knew that things were quite different. He got out of prison. I came to a place called Gordon College out in Massachusetts here. And uh, I prayed for Provo, and he always told me that he was going to buzz me with his Harley, that someday I was going to be listening and not hear this Harley roar. And if you've ever heard it, you know what I'm talking about. And he was going to buzz me. And I thought he was coming back to Grace, but I had moved to Gordon. And so I always wondered, once someday I'm going to hear up along Frost Hall, all of a sudden I'm going to hear this Harley and stuff scare the daylights out of the president or something. So you see this big old tattooed guy. And I never heard it. And uh, I prayed for him for years that, that Christ would uh, come into his life and that he would become a Christian. Turns out uh, nobody told me, because I'm now separated by four or 500 miles, actually more than that, 1,000 miles from where I used to teach, and uh, Provo died. Uh, he was riding his motorcycle. His coat got caught in, and he was ejected off the motorcycle into a guardrail at 55, 60 miles an hour. Died instantly. Uh, died instantly. And nobody told me. I was so angry. It was like, I've been praying for this guy. This guy's been dead for two years, and I'm still praying for him. It was, what's wrong with this picture, you know? Why didn't somebody tell me? And I was at a conference. I had to speak down at an ETS con- a conference down in Atlanta. And there was a guy named Ron Clutter, who's a friend of mine. We went out for lunch and things, and Ron and I talked about old times and things. And, and as I was getting up from there, he turned to me and he said, do you, do you remember John in, in Provo? I said, yeah, what do you think? I said, man, I was so angry at you guys at Grace never telling me that he died, and I was praying for him and stuff. And he said, and, he, and, and I just, um, it choked up every time I think about it. And so Ron and I sat back down and he told me, he said, uh, this is the way Provo worked. He said, and I could never figure out, because he actually married a Christian girl. And I couldn't figure out, why would Provo marry a Christian girl and stuff? I said, something's not adding up here. And Ron told me that Provo made it. He became a Christian, but he did not want to tell anybody that he was a Christian. He wanted people to know he was a Christian by the change in his life. He wasn't going to rel- wear his religion on his, on his sleeve and stick it in your face and say, oh yeah, I've said the little formula. No, he said, Christ has changed my life. And people who know me will know that there is a difference because my life has changed. And so he never really broadcasted that he became a Christian, but his life had changed. And that's why he married that Christian girl. So Provo became a Christian. And I like, there's something like that, that I was just say, that his belief in Christ, he, he gave himself to those beliefs. And those beliefs changed his life, changed his life. And there's something to be said for that. That the words, how should I say, his provost thing was, was not, the words are cheap. Words are cheap. Let your life, the, the change, your life reflects Christ. And then people can't call you hypocrite or not. You are who you are. The change of belief has made in your heart that you're, you're walking in the footsteps of Jesus. And so Christ has changed his life. And so Provo, uh, so if you see, when we get to heaven or something, you see some guy up there with riding around in his Harley, man, and he's looking for me buzzing on his Harley and things, you just tell him, oh, Hildebrandt's over there waiting at the pearly gates. He hasn't gotten in yet. And tell Probo to come out and get me, and I'll ride in with him. But anyway, sorry for the 
that was, that was, anyways, okay. Point is, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's the gospel. Acts chapter 16, verse 9, the Philippian jailer. What must I do to be saved? Phenomenal. And it's interesting in our culture, too, how we've shifted things now. People don't want to talk about the Gospels, being saved, okay? They want to talk about things like social justice or doing other things and things. And so what happens is there's been this big shift, it seems to me, away from the, quote, traditional Gospel that one must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved to now saving Mother Earth or social justice. or we, we get off on all these causes that when we try to link them in and all this kind of stuff, and we kind of, we're almost ashamed of the gospel anymore because, you know, social justice is so, uh, our culture loves, you know, helping the poor and all this kind of stuff. And so we're patted on the head as Christians and stuff, long as we keep our mouths shut about the gospel. And so I think you got to be really careful about the shifts that are taking place in our culture now. And what I'm saying is the gospel. What is the gospel? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you should be saved. Okay? That's really important. Okay? When we said major and the majors, that's one of the majors. Okay? What does it mean to believe in Jesus? What does it mean? Knowing the facts, accepting the facts as true, and trusting yourself in those facts, and then walking in the footsteps of Jesus. Okay, so that's the Philippian jailer. Lydia, seller of purple. Then what happens next? Okay, so he trucks out of Philippi. Oh, by the way, I forgot one thing. At Philippi, guess what happens? The wees stop. So apparently, Luke went from Troas to Philippi, wee, 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 all the way to Philippi. And then when he's at Philippi, all of a sudden, the wees stop. And Paul goes on to Thessalonica, but then it's, he did this, he did that. It's not we anymore. So Luke apparently, second missionary journey, Luke goes from Troas to Philippi, stops there. So what happens at Thessalonica? They get to Thessalonica. As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue. This is Acts chapter 17, verse 5. On three, on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. And God-fearing Greeks and prominent women believe. When the God-fearing women believe and prominent women, God-fearing Greeks believe, the Jews become jealous. And what happens is they assault the house of Jason where Paul is staying. Paul is staying at this house of Jason, and basically the, the Jews then form a, a crowd. They come to assault the house of Jason. Paul basically beats it out the back door and escapes. And escapes. So at Thessalonica, uh, it's pretty uh, to the modern uh, Thessaloniki, but today, um, they, they assault the house of Jason. Paul skedaddles, gets out of there, um, and, and beats it by fleeing and things, okay? And they're saying their accusation was that he was saying there's another king, Jesus, instead of Caesar. And so they're going after Paul on that basis. Now, when they get to Berea, Berea is a special place. Uh, many of you have heard of Berean Bible chapels and things like that. The Bereans were uh, basically, Berea is just down the road from Thessalonica. These are the three cities in Macedonia up north in Greece and things. And it says, uh, now the Bereans were more noble character than the Thessalonians, Thessalon Thessalonians. For they received the message with great eagerness. And then this is what the Bereans are known for. Okay, When you say Berean Bible Chapel, a lot of Berean uh, Bible studies and things like that. They examined the scripture every day to see if what Paul said was true. So the Bereans pride themselves in that they examine the scriptures to see whether things are true. And that's a noble thing. They were more noble than the people at Thessalonica who beat up on Jason's house and that kind of thing. So uh, Paul then uh, leaves, actually, Silas and Timothy there. And then Paul heads down, leaving uh, Paul, Silas and Timothy there. Paul heads down here to Athens. Athens is located right here, so Paul heads down from Macedonia down to Athens. Athens is, uh, you know, the most famous city, Greek city. This is where Paul then at Mars Hill uh, speaks to the philosophers on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. And let me just read some of this, Acts chapter 17, verse 16. All the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Athens, the great home of Socrates. Athens, the great place of Plato, Aristotle, 
the great thinkers, the great philosophers, and things like that, Athens. Paul then goes and he says, As I walked about, I looked carefully at your objects of worship, and I found an altar with the inscription, To the unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. God made the world. The God made the world is served not by human hands making idols. Okay, In him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. This in him we live and move and have our being, he's quoting, I believe it's from Aratus here, one of the uh, Greek poets. Okay, One of the Greek poets. We are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think of that the divine being is like silver, gold, or stone. Okay? And he's quoting Epimenides in this kind of in those contexts as well. Okay? Um, so the question is, what is Paul doing here? And then this is the big question that Tertullius asked: what does Jerusalem have to do with Athens? What does Jerusalem have to do with Athens? And then this tension between Jerusalem, that is the place of religion, and Athens, the place of philosophy and things. It turns out that Paul seems to have interacted with Greek culture enough that he takes, for example, the, the uh, statue to the unknown god, and he says, I'm going to declare it to you now. He uses what's in their culture to proclaim Christ to them, using things that they're familiar with. And so he quotes from Aratus, he quotes from Epimenides, he quotes from these Greek writers, because they're familiar with that. And Paul, Paul is a very, very smart man, and he picks up on this stuff, and then he uses it as a, as a place of connection, a, a nexus between uh, his Christ that he's going to, to, to preach and their culture. And so this is, uh, it's, the suggestion is then, is it important for a Christian to be very aware of the culture in which we live? And is it important as a Christian to be aware of the culture and to be able to use the things in our culture to proclaim Christ? Should we know philosophy? Should we know philosophy? Should we know the philosophy of our day in order to proclaim Christ? And the answer is yes. And that's what a place like Gordon College is all about, liberal arts, where we, we study, seriously study philosophy. We've got some phenomenal philosophers here. And basically they teach philosophy to, to as a, and you're learning philosophy and learning what is the culture saying and, and what are the major influences that undergird and underpin this philosophy. What is the basic philosophies of our age and how do you interact with them as a Christian? Some of the philosophies, as even as Paul said, some of the things they say are true. Is it possible for an unregenerate, non-Christian person to say some true things? Of course it is. And so... You study philosophy and you sort out what things are true, what things are not true. And you basically, what are the things that are really hindering our, 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 our culture's understanding of Christ? And at what points can we attack and make, and make argumentations on that? You study philosophy. Do you study history? History again, in order to understand our culture and proclaim Christ, you need to understand history. Do you need to I understand? We've got English classes here. You've got communications classes. Do we need to express the gospel in these new mediums? That is, uh, the digital medium, and that's one of the things I really argue strongly for. That we as Christians need to understand this digital medium that is so important in our culture, in terms of our our listening with buds in our ears and watching on television screens, on pads on phones, on PCs, and laptops, and all sorts of things, whatever it is, uh, we basically are taking this digital medium, and, and we as Christians need to understand how do you communicate in this new medium. And so communications, we use music here, art, and all sorts of forms that we understand and, 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 and we work with. And that's the, the basis for Christian education is basically, if you have to put it in one sentence, I guess Arthur Holmes probably did the best job. The guy was totally... Uh, credible with this. All truth is God's truth. All truth is God's truth. And so we do sciences, we do biology, we do chemistry, we do physics. Not as people who are afraid of those disciplines and that they're going to affect their religion, but no, no, God is the author of science and things. So yes, I want to be understand science from, as a Christian from a biological, from a chemical, from a physics kind of perspective. And even mathematics, the language of the universe, to understand that. 
and get a handle on how the cosmos is actually and how things are ordered and how we can construct things mathematically. It's just incredible. So anyways, that's what we're basically for the liberal arts education for. And Paul then, at Athens, he speaks to the philosophers very fluently in their language. He speaks in their language, the language of, of these idols that they were worshiping and, and in the language of their poets and in their philosophers. And so we also need to be very aware of our culture, and that's kind of the basis for one of the ba one of the bases. Of, uh, people on this campus could argue it much better than I I can, but uh, one of the bases for a substantial uh, embrace of the liberal arts. Paul at Athens. What does Jerusalem have to do with Athens? Everything. Okay. From Athens, then Paul goes to Corinth, and this is uh, we've we've taken a little bit too long on some of these others, but Corinth uh, Corinth is where Paul stays for a year and a half. On the second missionary journey, this is where Paul settles down, at Corinth. Okay, So second missionary journey, he starts at Antioch, goes through you know all the cities, Antioch, Lystra, and things, picks up Timothy, goes up to Troas, picks up Luke, goes over to Macedonia, Philippi, Philippian jailer, Thessalonica, Jason's house, Berea, they study the scriptures. He comes down to Athens, does his thing there, hits Corinth. When he hits Corinth, he stays there for a year and a half. So second missionary journey, almost two years at Corinth. Okay, Now, when he's at Corinth, we're in Acts chapter 18 now. In Acts chapter 18, verses 1 and following, it says, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy. Now, why had Aquila come from Italy? And his wife's name was Priscilla. So this is where you have Aquila and Priscilla. Okay, Aquila is the man, Priscilla is the wife. And because Claudius, and this Claudius is, I think it was around 49, I'm not sure of the exact date, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. So here you get this anti-Semitism stuff, even in Claudius, the emperor, ordering them to leave Rome. And so Priscilla and Aquila left Rome, which would be over here, and came to Corinth. Again, we remember how the connection between Rome and Corinth? We said the sailors sailing. Rather than sailing all around this Peloponnese here, they sail in here, in this nice harbor here, and then they unload and cross this seven-mile isthmus here from one side to the next, and then they go over to Ephesus and things. So you save yourself all this traveling around this rocky shoreline and bad shoreline here and just go in here, unload, reload, and then come across. So Priscilla and Aquila, he meets them there, and then we should say, what does he do? He makes tents. Actually, Priscilla and Aquila apparently um, makes t he makes tents. This is where uh, Paul makes tents. Um, many Christian people, they say they're tent makers. And what does that mean? It means like a guy is, uh, for example, in Afghanistan. Do you remember there was a missionary there who was actually killed dead? This is a real shame. But he uh, was a missionary for, I think it was 28 years in Afghanistan. He was an ophthalmologist. In other words, he helped the Afghani people with their sight. And he was an ophthalmologist in Afghanistan. And I think the Taliban um, got a hold of him and butchered him, killed him and things. And that was just, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago. And what happened was he was in Afghanistan doing what? Well, yeah, he was a missionary of sorts, but he actually was a tent maker. He actually worked. Uh, providing them with services with uh, ophthalmology and things like that. I had some uh, student friends and things from uh, former college I worked at Grace that uh, went to Germany. And I think one of them was an architect, one of them was an a engineer, and I'm not sure what the third one was. But these three guys got together and they said, hey, let's become missionaries to Germany. And so what they did was they used their architect, he was an architect, he used his architectural stuff to actually work a job in Germany. And the other guy was an engineer and he worked as an engineer in Germany. And uh, he's probably, you know, designing Mercedes Benz or something. But anyway, he's worked as an engineer there. And then what would happen is they would get involved with the churches and help with the churches in Germany and things. So that's called tent making. And it's built off this passage in Corinth that Paul, Priscilla, and Aquila, they made tents. And uh, that's what they did. So Paul, uh, I kind of like that, actually, uh, the Jewish way of education. In America, we educate, you know, in schools and this kind of stuff. The Jewish people educate their kids in Torah, but they also give their kids a skill. They also give their kids a skill. And so Jesus, for example, Jesus was called the what? The son of the carpenter. But if you go into some of the passages, I think it's in Mark, it says Jesus himself was a carpenter. And so what happened is the father would have a trade, and the kid would actually learn the trade, actually a trade off his father. Now, he would also learn Torah and the ways to think, 
but they would also learn a skill. And so I think in life it was pretty important, I think, to get both of those. I know when I was going through high school and stuff, the vocational stuff was put down as being non-academic and, and be beneath us and things, and then you find out you can't get a job. And so it's good to have some just down-to-earth pragmatic skills. And the Jewish people train people both in terms of their mind and also their hands and skills and stuff. And so Paul was a tent maker. Paul was a rabbi, very trained under Gamaliel, the guy really bright, but he also knew how to make tents, and so that's what he does. And he supports himself at Corinth, which is interesting. This is going to come up later in 2 Corinthians. He says, I didn't let you guys support me. I didn't let you guys. Corinth was known for its wealth. He said, I wouldn't take any of your wealth because I don't want that to hinder my ministry here by you guys saying, well, you just came here to get money. No, no, no. I made tents and supported myself when I was here. So Paul was very independent. You get this not... Uh, Paul was not an entitled missionary. Like, I come in and I'm a missionary and you guys got to all support me because I'm the big Boana missionary and things. No, no, Paul worked with his hands, supported himself, and uh, took care of business. So that's at Corinth. Priscilla and Aquila, uh, his uh, ministry there with them, and that's a pretty... Um, and he spends a year and a half there at Corinth. So the church at Corinth is going to be um, it's going to be a big deal. Now, when he's at Corinth, Timothy and Silas come down from Thessalonica. And so what happens is Paul then writes the Thessalonians, second missionary journey from Corinth. He's going to be there for a year. And he writes back first and second Thessalonians and up to the Thessalonian people. So you've got this kind of thing going on with Paul writing back to the Thessalonians from Corinth and things. Um, another thing we should say at this point, too, why did Paul stay in Corinth uh, for so long? Usually in other cities, Paul got beat up and had to flee for his life. Well, here's what happens at Corinth. He goes into the synagogue and preaches in there, and Crispus, the synagogue, the synagogue leader, becomes a Christian. The synagogue leader becomes a Christian. Sosthenes, who wasn't the synagogue leader, but another guy, comes and starts making trouble for Paul. So he hauls tail, Paul's tail in in front of Galileo. Galileo is the governor, big uh, you know, govern, governor type person. And so Sosthenes has Paul dragged in before a, a, a Gentile court. But when Galileo, the governor, sees this, he says, these are a bunch of squabbling Jews. I don't want to get involved with this. I don't know what they're doing. And so he throws them out of court. He dismisses the charges. So this guy comes with charges against Paul. The Galileo, the governor, throws him out of court and says, hey, get out of here, this is garbage, I don't want to deal with this, and throws him out. What happens to Sosthenes, rather than Paul getting beat up, Sosthenes gets beat up. And so Paul is off the hook. The other guy got beat up that time, so Paul says, hey, I like this place, we're going to stay here for a while. And so Paul stays there for a year and a half, and uh, he writes Thessalonians from there. So that's kind of the background for some of that stuff. And then Paul, okay, so then he stays at Corinth a year, year and a half, Priscilla and Aquila. There's another guy named Apollos who's important later on. Apollos was a man mighty in Scripture. He understood the Old Testament Scriptures really well. Becomes a Christian, and then he becomes a, a major force at Corinth. Paul, you know, knows of him and links up with him. Priscilla and Aquila, Apollos and stuff. And then Paul does wee, wee, wee all the way home from Corinth. He leaves and goes back and he goes back to Israel and things. Okay, so that's the second missionary journey. When does the second missionary journey take place? You don't have to know the date. All the date you gotta know is what? Jerusalem Council, 50 AD. First missionary journey, right before that, 48, 49, right before it. Second missionary journey, 50 AD, right after it, 51, 52, right after it. Okay, so first missionary journey, Jerusalem Council, second missionary journey, and second missionary journey largely at Corinth for two years, although he gets there through Lystra, Troas, Philippi, and these various places, picking up Luke and Timothy, as we said before. Now, we want to move to the third missionary journey, and you'll be happy to know there are only three missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. Okay, so what happens on the third missionary journey? Okay, and let's just uh, kind of run through this. Okay. Oh, here's the, here's the, the uh, actual PowerPoints. Well, let's just run through this kind of as a quick review you got Paul and Silas, second missionary journey. He hits Lystra, where, where he was stoned on the first missionary journey. He picks up Timothy. He has Timothy circumcised. We said his father was Greek and father was Jewish and stuff. Uh, after the Jerusalem Council, why was Timothy circumcised? Not to be saved, but to fit in and not make himself an offense to the Jewish people. He goes to Troas, 
can't go into Asia. The Spirit will not let him go to Asia, to Ephesus. And so he goes to Troas, and that's where he gets the Macedonian call. Come over to Macedonia, and the angel says, and help us and things. And this is uh, following God's leading, contrary to our plans. Paul wanted to go to Ephesus in Asia, but God didn't want him. And then when Luke joins, Luke joins at Troas, and this is when the we's start. And the we's go from Troas to Philippi, and then they stop. So apparently... Luke went from Troas to Philippi and then, and then stayed at Philippi. At Philippi, Lydia was the seller of purple, woman of means, helps out, seller of purple from Thyatira. And then also you get, uh, there's no synagogue there. Remember we said they were by the river, no synagogue, so there's very few Jews there. There was actually some anti-Semitic uh, pressures there, it seems. The slave girl, Paul cast the demons out of the slave girl. Paul is beaten and thrown in prison where he's singing with Silas. Singing with Silas. That almost sounds like it should be anyways. Okay, singing with Silas. The Philippians jailers question, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you should be saved. Tremendous passage there. And then uh, what does it mean to what does it mean to believe? And we talked about three levels of belief as well as uh, works and how that interacts and things. Thessalonica, they go to the synagogue as was their custom in Thessalonica. There's negative Jewish jealousy and reaction, and then basically they assault the house of Jason, and Jason's house is assaulted. Paul escapes before the crowd can get him. They go to Berea. The Bereans are more noble. They search the scriptures. That's a good thing, Berean Bible chapels, those kind of things. He goes to Athens. Athens on Mars Hill, we said. In Mars Hill, uh, you get this uh, Mars Hill. You know where the Parthenon is? The Parthenon, the big thing in, Mar, uh, in Athens, you always see Mars Hill is just off, off from that. There's idols to the unknown God. Paul uses those to declare Christ and stuff. Paul quotes Epimenides and Artus. So knowing philosophies and the other disciplines, Paul, and this is our rationale for liberal arts. There's many ways you can tackle a liberal arts question, but this is one of them at Athens and philosophy and various things. History, we must uh, believe before we can know, uh, presupposition or can knowing lead us to belief in terms of evidences. And so there's a big debate on that. I don't want to get into that now. Uh, how can we use postmodern culture to proclaim Christ? And this is a big thing for us. How can we use postmodern culture to proclaim Christ? We need to understand our culture, and we need to know what its positives are, what its negatives are, and how we can use it to proclaim Christ. Okay. So second missionary journey, he goes to Corinth, and that's where he is for a year and a half. This is the big place. You've got Priscilla and Aquila basically kicked out of Rome under Claudius. They kicked him out of Rome in their tent making with Paul on that point. Crispus, the synagogue leader, actually believes. So this is kind of unique for Paul. And then Sosthenes accuses Paul, and Sosthenes is beaten rather than Paul. And so Paul says, I like this place. Uh, Galileo, the proconsul, was favorable, dismisses the charges on Paul. And so Paul stays there for a year and a half. And as he stays there, he meets this guy, Apollos, who is a man mighty in Scripture and uh, the Old Testament and things like that. And this is where he writes First and Second uh, Thessalonians and basically sends it back up with uh, Timothy and brought down some support from Macedonia to Paul. Okay, so now what happens? Third missionary journey. The third missionary journey, let me make a brilliant statement, the third missionary journey takes place after the second missionary journey. Okay, So second missionary journey, Jerusalem Council, 50 AD. Second missionary journey, 50 to 52. And this one's going to come after that, uh, largely 53 to 57. I don't want you to know the dates. Okay, 53 to 57, no, it's about three years. Actually, the way, way, best way to remember this, third missionary journey, three years at Ephesus. Third missionary journey, three years at Ephesus. Second missionary journey, two years at Corinth. It's actually a year and a half, but anyways, two years at Corinth. Second missionary journey, two years at Corinth. Third missionary journey, three years at Ephesus. So what happens? Paul wanted to go to Ephesus on the second missionary journey, but the Spirit wouldn't let him. This time, he starts out at Antioch again. All three missionary journeys start there. He makes his way back through this Galatian territory, and this time, he makes a beeline straight for Ephesus, and he's going to stay at Ephesus, which is considered the province of Asia, in Asia, Ephesus, uh, and he's going to basically be there for three years. Now, what happens at Ephesus? Let me just kind of walk through this. Uh, first of all, he meets some of John the Baptist's old disciples. And what does he do to these guys? He says, hey, uh, what's the deal here? 
Uh, do you know anything about the Holy Spirit? Do you know anything about Jesus? They say, no, no, all we know is about John the Baptist. He baptized us. We repented of our sins and stuff. They don't know about Jesus. He tells them about Jesus. He lays hands on them. They speak in tongues, and they become Christians. Okay, so that's at Ephesus. You've got John the Baptist's disciples being converted there. Paul then goes into the school of Tyrannus, and he teaches them. And Paul develops a teaching ministry here. And what happens is so many people start in Ephesus to become Christians that they start burning their books. They have these magical books, and they start burning their books and that kind of thing, which is interesting. And then, um, yeah, okay, now, what happens, okay? Uh, they start burning their books, and then there's a guy named Demetrius at Ephesus. And Demetrius is a silversmith. Demetrius is a silversmith. And he makes idols for Artemis, the god, goddess of Ephesus. This is a kind of fertility god thing, love god kind of thing. Uh, you know, it's all sorts of immorality involved. If you've ever seen any of the goddesses uh, that we've actually dug up archaeologically, you realize how very sensual and debauched, debauched that much of this uh, stuff was. But anyways, uh, rumor has it that apparently a meteor came down and stuck in the ground. So a meteor came down, and they dug up this meteor, and this meteor then they considered a god that had you know, kind of come down out of heaven. And they called this god then this meteor that had hit Artemis and things. And then they made statues of Artemis and stuff portrayed as a, as a woman and things like that. Artemis or Ishtar, as we, if you know and some of the other things that was going on, Baal and Ishtar. So he's a silversmith. All these people becoming Christians. What happens? His business dries up, okay? It's not a good business model. All these people become Christians. They don't do idols anymore. I'm losing my business. This is a problem, okay? So basically he starts a riot. So he gets all the people together, and these people all gather together, and they start screaming, you know, Artemis, great as Artemis, goddess of the Ephesians. Great as Artemis, goddess of the Ephesians. And it's like Paul is telling all these people that they don't have to worship these gods anymore, and we're losing money, man. And so it's like the union's out against, uh, you know, Paul, and they're trying to raise Cain. They're going to have a riot against Paul and, and all this kind of stuff. And so that's kind of what's going down. Our money and religion connected. Our money and religion connected to this day. Okay? And so Demetrius then is losing his money, so then he starts raising Cain with these, uh, with these idols and things. So, okay. Um, he then, um, claims that these people are doing all sorts of, Christians are doing all sorts of these bad things. Uh, how do people in our culture proclaim Christianity as being bad? Okay, people in our culture, they don't agree with us, and so they'll make accusations. And I don't know whether you've heard, we're in the Boston area here. You read the Boston Globe for about a year. I canceled my subscription to that crazy thing because uh, for about five years, the, the front line in the newspaper was the same thing. They just rotated words and things and just the same uh, anti-this, anti-that kind of thing. They went after the Roman Catholic Church. And so all Roman Catholics, you know, they're, they're child molesters. All Roman Catholic priests and stuff, they're in this child molesting thing. And so they were really, really scathing and really going after the Roman Catholic Church. By the way, child molestation is really bad. And I'm not excusing that, but boy, I'll tell you, the media, media just was really on that over and over and over again. And it just, um, anyway, so I'm, I'm saying these kind of things. There's a guy, um, well, my son tells a story of he was in this uh, high school class called, I think it was Film, Food, and Fiction. Film, Food, and Fiction. And in this class, you know, they have, um, they have an atheist person. And then we have to be open to atheism. And so we need to be tolerant to a person who's an atheist. You have to be talent, tolerant to a person who's a Muslim and things. And you've got to understand. And then here's this gay kid and stuff, and he's really struggling with his own sexual identity, and you need to be understanding of that and things. And then, understanding and tolerance. And here, oh, here's a Christian. Here's a Christian. That, that terrible, stinking, hypocritical Christian and things like this. Isn't this Christian disgusting? So here you've got tolerance for everybody, but when you mention the fact that you're Christian, all of a sudden, they feel absolute freedom to go and... and say all these really nasty things, intolerant things. It's okay to be intolerant against Christians. Okay? And so, and even till this day, there's uh, tons of things. We have this guy uh, who came, even came to Gordon's Chapel and stuff. I'll just call him Frank. 
And he's not very frank, and he just uh, needs his head examined. But he would come in and make all these really accusations against Christianity, saying Christianity is just like the Taliban. Christianity, fundamental Christianity, fundamental Christianity is just like the Taliban. And so he makes all these kind of things in terms of hate speech, in terms of hate speech. The fundamental Christians are doing hate speech and all this kind of stuff. And the honest truth is I think we need to pray for the guy, but it just did. It just here he was raised in a very uh, Christian home and things, but it's totally rejected the stuff and just and basically now he just goes around attacking Christians in the name of tolerance. Okay, and you can see the irony of this. He's supposed to be tolerant and stuff, and he's just making all these wild accusations that just shows the guy has no clue about the fundamentalistic Christians that he was talking about. This guy is absolutely clueless about what these people really hold. And I'm talking about his father and mother, and I wish just he understood an ounce of what his father and mother taught. His father and mother really helped me personally. And now his, their son is, is kind of like Hezekiah. Hezekiah in the Old Testament was a good king. And then he has his son Manasseh, who is just one of the worst evil kings. And, and it's kind of like that. You have these parents who are really godly parents, and this kid then, now he's a man, he's my age kind of thing. And now he's just going around ripping Christianity, thinking he's a big, and that's how he's made a name, name for himself. And you just say, it's really sad, really, really sad. And um, But anyways, so I guess pity. Pity is probably the worst thing, and probably this thing the guy despises the most. But I say, you've got to pity the man. He's, uh, he's really lost in many ways. So what happens, okay? So all these accusations come against Paul. He's a Christian. He's doing all this thing. He's defaming uh, Artemis, the goddess of the Ephesians and things. Now, the important thing here at Ephesus, he spends three years there. Three years at Ephesus. While he's there, he's going to have time. He's teaching in the school of Tyrannus. He's going to have time. What's his other favorite city? His other favorite city is Corinth. So what's going to happen is, from Ephesus, on the third missionary journey, he's going to write to Corinth. Corinth, the people have been traveling back and forth, and they're basically telling Paul, Paul, the, the church at Corinth is having big times problems here. So Paul hears about the problems. What are some of the problems? Oh, these guys are getting drunk at communion and stuff. That's not good. And the guy's sleeping with his father's wife. That's really bad. And so Paul's got this stuff going down. And so Paul says, hey, man, I'm going to write this letter of 1 Corinthians. So he writes 1 Corinthians. Now, you understand, uh, 1 Corinthians, there's actually many. Paul wrote more letters to the Corinthians than we have. We know that. There's other Corinthian letters mentioned, um, the tear letter, things like that. So Paul wrote many letters to the Corinthians. We have two of them. So this was 1 Corinthians or whatever. He writes to uh, Corinth on the third missionary journey. That's a big deal. Corinth is a very big book. So now what happens? He's going to leave Ephesus. And when he leaves Ephesus, he's going to go up through Macedonia. And as he goes up through Macedonia, so he goes back up through Troas, and he's going to hit Philippi again, Thessalonica, Berea. And he's going to come down to, again to Corinth. When he's up there, he's starting to raise money He's starting to raise money for the poor people in Jerusalem. This, on the third missionary journey, this becomes a big missionary, mission thing with Paul. He's heard that there's a famine in Jerusalem where people are, you know, there's no food and things. And so Paul is using the church to raise money to help feed the people in Jerusalem, okay? So is, you know, social justice kind of part of the response to Christianity? Yes, Paul's helping now. He's ra ra raising money in the church. So he's going to hit the Macedonians. The Macedonians were really good givers. And so he basically heads up here. And he's at Thessalonica up in this area. And by the way, when he's up there, who's really got a lot of money? The Macedonians have some money and stuff, but who's known to be wealthy? The Corinthians. And so what Paul does is, from up here, he writes 1 Corinthians from Ephesus. And then as he travels up to Macedonia, he sends 2 Corinthians down. He sends 2 Corinthians down from Macedonia, telling them, what is the message of 2 Corinthians? This is terrible, but just to put it briefly, Paul is saying, hey, I'm coming, and I'm going to raise money. I'm raising money for the poor people in Jerusalem who have experienced the famine. Get your money ready so that when I come, you're, you're going to be ready to give. Uh, does anybody remember the passage where it says, God loves a cheerful giver? Where does that occur? 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is where Paul is making a plea for money to help the poor people in, in Jerusalem. So if you, you want to get good passages for you know pleading for people to give money, 2 Corinthians is a great place to go. So 1 Corinthians from Ephesus over, then he goes up there, he's hit Macedonia, he writes 2 Corinthians on the third missionary journey. 
So 1st and 2nd Corinthians are both written on the third missionary journey. He comes down to Corinth then, meets the people there, and basically, you know, collecting money for the poor people in Jerusalem. What happens then? Okay. What happens then is, he's at Corinth, he realizes he's raising money, and he's going to come back and revisit people and go back to, to Israel with this money. But what, what his eye is on, his eye is like going west. Paul is a missionary, he always sought to be at, at new territory. And so from Corinth, he's going to look west and he's going to write the book of Romans. From Corinth, on the third missionary journey, he's going to look and he says, Hey, Romans, I don't know, I've never started a church with you guys or anything, but I, I want to go to Rome and I'm going to see you sometime and I'm going to send you a letter. And so he writes from Corinth on the third missionary journey, he writes the book of Romans telling them that he's wanting to come visit them. And uh, that's the book of Romans. Now, why is this cool about the third missionary journey? Third missionary journey, three years at Ephesus, okay? What books are written on the third missionary journey? First Corinthians, second Corinthians, down to raise money, and the book of Romans as he's ready to leave Corinth. First Corinthians, second Corinthians, the book of Romans. Are those three huge books by the Apostle Paul? Romans, first and second Corinthians. And they're all written on the third missionary journey. Okay, so this is, Paul's very productive here. Any of those books, if you read them, they're incredible. So, okay, now what happens? Um, there's just one other thing, and I think this is uh, kind of a, this is in chapter 20, verse 9. Paul makes his, collects his money here, goes back up to Macedonia and collects the money. He comes down here, he wants to say goodbye to the people of Ephesus, meets down here, but he stops up. And, and basically, I believe it's at Troas or something, he, at Troas, he starts preaching. Paul starts preaching. And uh, let me just read this in chapter 20, verse 9. Uh, some of my students, uh, you guys know what this is all about, okay? Um, chapter 20, verse 9 of Acts, it says this. Um, Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking until midnight, there were many lamps in the upper upstairs rooms and where they were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story window and was picked up as dead. Okay? And so this picture of Eutychus falling to sleep as the Apostle Paul is preaching on and on and on. Kind of reminds you of New Testament class sometimes, doesn't it? Anyways, so he's, he falls out the third story window, you know, three stories up. That's what, 30 feet, falls down. He's asleep. They pick him up for dead. Paul basically heals the guy, brings him back up, and you know, he comes back alive and things like that. So anyways, the story of Eutychus. The story of Eutychus up at Troas. And it's just kind of an interesting, funny story. If you've ever done any public speaking and people have gone to sleep on you, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. So uh, Paul then takes and he goes back to Israel. And now what's going to happen? This gets pretty serious with Paul, and we'll go through this quickly. Um, Paul hits into Caesarea area. And uh, there's a guy named Agabus there. He's a prophet. And he basically, Agabus takes off this belt, stuff, ties Paul's hands and says, whoever's aware of this belt is going to be tied up when he gets to Jerusalem. So the spirit is telling through Agabus. Agabus, by the way, is a prophet, not a writing prophet. And there were apparently, remember we talked about Philip. Philip had four prophesying daughters. And so these were people who gave God's word, but they didn't... Uh, they weren't writers of scripture per se. And we know even in the Old Testament, Nathan, for example, that rebuked David in uh, 2 Samuel 12 there, uh, Nathan never really wrote any of the prophecies. Uh, neither did Micaiah, neither did Huldah, the prophetess, and things. So there were other prophets besides Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, the ones, Daniel, who wrote actually prophets. There were prophets that were writing prophets. There were other prophets that just spoke things, and their words are gone. Agabus is one of those prophets. He binds Paul. Paul uh, he says, don't go up to Jerusalem, Paul. You're going to get in trouble. And Paul says, what? The Spirit's taking me. I, I raised this money for the people of Jerusalem. I'm going up there. So Paul goes up to Jerusalem, and guess what happens? He's in the Temple Mount. The Jews incite a riot and stuff, and basically the Romans come in, and Paul, poor Paul then is captured there and uh, basically uh, is, is going to be put in prison. And so this is, um, yeah. 
Now let's jump in. Actually, this is Acts chapter 24 now as we move through and just see what's going on with Paul. Um, actually, um, yeah. Okay, there's one passage that I wanted to pick up, and that is... Uh, Let's see if I can pull this here. Um, there's a, a, a Roman guard when Paul's arrested. And um, Paul's arrested. They're trying to kill him and things. And the soldiers, basically. Um, and one of the soldiers there, um, and I'm, I'm losing it here. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is in chapter 22. It is verse 25. Paul, there's a riot in Paul uh, and the Temple Mount. The Jews riot. Whenever the Jews riot, the Roman soldiers come out, and so they drag Paul away. And basically, so they took Paul straight to the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God and all good conscience to this day. At this, uh, the high priest, order, Annas, Ananias, ordered uh, those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. And anyway, so it gets bad for Paul and things. But just before that, um, they were going to stretch Paul out. There it is. They directed that he be flogged. So the Romans basically see Paul as causing this riot. So they drag him in, probably to the Antonia Fortress, and basically they're going to they're going to flog him. Okay. So they stretch him out to flog him. And as they stretched him out to flog him, this is twenty two twenty five of the Acts. Paul said to the centurion standing there, "Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen?" who hasn't even been found guilty. When the centurion, okay, so the centurion hears this. This guy is over 100 guys. The centurion was going to flog him. When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander. So this guy is a centurion. He goes to his commander, okay? Um, I've got some records in, in Jerusalem. The 10th Legion was there. And if you go in Jerusalem on certain of the rocks, you'll see an X on the rocks just outside the new Imperial Hotel if you've got going to get lost in Jerusalem online, you can actually go there and walk the streets and go up to the new Imperial Hotel. And you'll see a little X on this uh, little marker there. And that's to say it's the 10th Legion. So the Romans uh, had their legions stationed there, and uh, although that's from a later time. Um, and the commander said this, okay, the commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a big price for my citizenship, but I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Paul said, I was born a citizen. This guy said, I had to pay big money to get my citizenship. You're a citizen of Rome. You don't get beat like that. When you're a citizen of Rome, you don't get beat like that because you're a citizen of Rome. It gives you status and stuff. And so this guy said, I paid a big price for it. Uh, I'm not, you know, I take Roman citizenship very seriously. Um, do you remember when... Um, Peter, this isn't in the Bible, but it's in the early church, Fox Book of Martyrs, other places and stuff. Peter was crucified. Peter was a Jew, and so he was crucified. And when they went to crucify Peter, he said, I'm not worthy to die like the Lord. So they crucified him upside down. I don't recommend it. It's got to be that been really bad. But anyway, so they crucified Peter upside down. Paul, however, could not be crucified. Paul could not be crucified. He was a Roman citizen. And so Paul was probably, he died probably about 68 AD. He would be beheaded. He would be beheaded. Uh, Peter probably died about 64, 65. Paul died a few years, about three or four years later. Okay, But the Roman citizenship becomes a big thing. Now, let me just run through these guys. So Paul's back. He's up in Jerusalem. And, uh, let, oh, we forgot to run through. Let's just run through third missionary journey. Three years at Ephesus, third missionary journey, three years at Ephesus. He writes the book of Corinth, 1 Corinthians first. John the Baptist's disciples received the Holy Spirit at Ephesus. Magical books are burned at Ephesus. Demetrius makes a riot, money and religion. He's losing money as a silversmith. Nobody's buying his idols, and so he gets upset. How does religion fare in public square? And we talked some about that. He, Paul revisits Macedonia. And when he's revisiting Macedonia, Macedonian people were good givers and things. He writes 2 Corinthians down to the Corinthian church, tell them to get their funds ready for when he comes down. He arrives at Corinth, and at Corinth he writes Romans. Romans, 
looking to the west as he realizes he's got to go to the east. He's going back to Jerusalem, but he looks to Rome, and he, he writes the book of Romans, 16 chapters there. And he revisits Macedonia. He revisits Eutychus falls asleep at Troas in Asia, where Ephesus is, and he heads back to Jerusalem with this gift for the poor because of the famine in Jerusalem. Now, at his trials, then, he's captured. He's almost flogged, but they let him off. He goes in front of this guy, Felix, and I'm just going to narrate this. This is in chapter 25, Acts chapter 25. And basically what Felix does is, Felix uh, has Paul come in, and um, there's basically... Um, Felix wants to establish good relationships with the Jews, and Paul is hated by the Jews. And so basically, uh, Felix... Um, Make some comments here. This is in chapter 24, excuse me, chapter 24. And both Felix refers to it as the Nazarite sect, that Paul is part of the Nazarite sect. So they were called the Nazarenes. And like you had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, now you had the Nazarenes. So as viewed as, you know, as Christianity for its first part was viewed under the umbrella of Judaism as another sect of Judaism. And as long, by the way, as they were under that sect of Judaism, they were under the protective care of the Roman. Romans didn't mess with the Jews that much and things. It's when Christianity pulled out from the, under the umbrella of Judaism, that's when Christianity got into some trouble. Paul then mentions people of the way. And so this way, this hodos thing, with the way is also another way Christianity was to, determined in here. But what happened? Uh, Felix says, manana, tomorrow, tomorrow we'll deal with this problem and stuff. So they sent him, Paul down from Jerusalem, down to Caesarea to be tried by Felix. Felix gets Paul and he just says, you know, there's no rush tomorrow and stuff. Actually, what Felix in the text tells us, what Felix wanted was a bribe. Felix wanted a bribe from Paul. Why? Because Paul was apparently able to raise money in, in Greece and other places, and so Felix is trying to get a take a piece of this action, and so he wants a bribe from Paul. And so Paul sits in jail for two years under Felix down at Caesarea on the coast, uh, just north of uh, Tel Aviv or Jaffa. Okay, so Paul's in prison for two years. By the way, what do we remember happening? Who's with him? Luke is with him, so that means that Luke is in Palestine for two years. What does that mean? Is Luke probably interviewing Mary and the apostles and finding out stories of Jesus to write to most excellent Theophilus, to write his book of Luke, and Luke is also going to write the book of what? Acts. And so this is the very story here with Felix Festus, and Paul has Luke with him, and Luke is writing uh, the story of Acts, okay? Probably to most excellent Theophilus to help Paul with his court case when he goes to Rome. So anyways, Felix, bad guy, procrastinator, two years, wanting a bribe out of Paul and stuff. Now what happens is Felix passes off the scene, Festus comes in as the next uh, kind of governor thing, and Festus, because he's the new kid on the block, Festus wants to make good relations with the Jews. The Jews send down people from Jerusalem and they say, hey Festus, you want to be good with us? I'll tell you what, you bring Paul back up to Jerusalem, we as the Sanhedrin, as a Jewish judicial body, we are the ones that should try Paul. So bring Paul back to Jerusalem. But little did Festus know that the Jews were making a plot that on the way up to Jerusalem from Caesarea, which is right on the coastline, up to Jerusalem, the Jews were going to ambush him and basically kill Paul on the way there. So there would be no trial. Paul would be killed dead. Okay. So what Paul does is Paul finds out about the trap. And so what Paul does is he says, hey, I appeal to Caesar. And as a Roman citizen, he had the right to make an appeal to Caesar. And so he makes an appeal to Caesar, and now Festus has got a problem. The problem is, he's got to, as a Roman citizen, he's got to send Paul to, to Caesar, but what's the problem? He has no charges. On what charges is he going to send him to Rome? So because there's no charges then, this is where the next guy gets into the picture. There's a guy named Agrippa, and Agrippa gets into the picture, and... Um, Agrippa is a guy who, and Festus and Agrippa are like becoming friends over this. And so Agrippa understands the way. He understands the Nazarenes. And so in chapter 26, you have this, uh, this back and forth between Paul. So Paul motioned with his hands and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are so well acquainted 
with all Jewish customs. So Paul, he's coming before Agrippa, he flatters him and he says, hey, I've heard you know a lot about our customs and things like that. And then Paul says, I, I'm a Pharisee and I'm basically here uh, because of the question of the resurrection and things like that. And um, yeah, so Agrippa goes, um, yeah, yeah. So he goes to Agrippa and he actually gets a little aggressive. Paul gets a little aggressive with Agrippa and he actually starts presenting the gospel to Agrippa and notice what Festus does here. It's interesting. Festus and Agrippa are both there. Paul's, you know, giving a speech before them. And at this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. And this is what Festus says. This is chapter 26, verse 24. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. Your great learning is driving you insane. And that's, some people say that about Gordon College and our students here, that their great learning is driving them insane. And so Paul here, uh, obviously Festus knows Paul is a very, very educated person. And so he says, your great learning is driving you insane. And then he goes to Agrippa and he says, do you think Agrippa, he actually starts witnessing to Agrippa about Christ and stuff. And Agrippa objects and he says, do you think that in such short time you can persuade me to be a Christian, Paul? And this is almost persuaded, almost persuaded. Notice he calls him a Christian. So we've got the Nazarite, we've got the way, and we've got now being called a Christian. And, and Agrippa, almost, almost you persuade me to become a Christian, almost, but lost. And so that's kind of what Agrippa, but now what it is, Agrippa can help Festus come up with the charges, and they basically put Paul in a boat, and they're going to basically ship him back. Uh, the, and basically, this is where the boat goes from Caesarea, goes across uh, the uh, Mediterranean Sea, over to the Isle of Malta. And this is where you have uh, Acts chapter 27. People say that this is one of the best descriptions in the ancient world of a shipwreck. And it's describing the waves coming at the boat and stuff, and then throwing all the stuff overboard, wanting to throw the prisoners overboard to lighten the boat. And uh, Paul says, you do that, and there's big trouble here. And so Paul gives them some advice. They end up shipwrecking on this Isle of Malta, which is just below Sicily. I think I've got a picture here. Let me just describe what's going on. They get on the Isle of Malta, and it's really interesting. A snake comes and bites Paul's hand. And so all the people conclude, this guy must be a murderer. They know he was you know, on charges to go to Rome. So they said, he must be a murderer. Now, this, he got out of the sea, but then the snake, this poisonous snake bites him. Paul should die. But then what happens is Paul doesn't die. The snake bite, Paul snakes, throws the snake back in the fire, kills the snake and stuff, and Paul, nothing happens to Paul. The people said, holy cow, this guy must be a god. This guy must be a god. And so Paul goes from being a murderer that the snake is to being this god and stuff on this Isle of Malta. And then eventually from the Isle of Malta, they catch another boat and go up to, uh, up to Rome, and then you've got Paul at Rome. And then, by the way, they hit Rome about 60 AD. This is called the first Roman imprisonment. Now, if there's a first Roman imprisonment, what do you figure? There's going to be a second Roman imprisonment, you're right. So he's in prison at Rome for about two years, and this is probably the book of Acts and most excellent Theophilus, people involved in helping get Paul free. Apparently, he was freed. Apparently, Paul was freed after this first Roman imprisonment, and then he was the period of freedom, and then there's the second Roman imprisonment, and the second Roman imprisonment, Paul gets, this is the end, okay, 67, 68 AD. Paul is then beheaded. Uh, this is when Paul dies, the second Roman imprisonment. So there's two Roman imprisonments, three missionary journeys, three missionary journeys, first, second, third, first Roman imprisonment, a little bit of freedom, and then back for a second Roman imprisonment, and at which time he was probably beheaded. Yeah, here's the map that actually runs through this stuff. And so you get this map where they go up the boat sails from Caesarea, a little Crete here, and then they hit the storm. And then here's the Isle of Malta just below Sicily. And you guys know about Sicily, you eat Sicilian pizza, you do the mob thing with the Anyway, Sicilia. Anyway, so they come up here and then up to Rome. And then that's where Paul does his uh, first Roman imprisonment. And the book of Acts uh, concludes, by the way. And what happens? Do we know the outcome of Paul's trial at the end of the book of Acts? And the answer is no. Paul is uh, basically, we don't know the outcome of that. So the, the assumption is then that the book of Acts finishes before 64 AD because we don't know the outcome of Paul's trial. And certainly we don't know that the temple, that never mentioned that the temple was destroyed 70 AD. And those two silences tell us that, okay, the book of Acts is probably closed down before Paul's trial was actually uh, 
And my suggestion and others' suggestions have been that this book was written to Theophilus so that Theophilus could have wherewithal to help defend Paul. Most excellent Theophilus could throw his weight on Paul's side, and uh, that would that would happen. There. Now, I think we'll call it quits there. When we pick up this next time, I'd like to kind of go through the books of Paul, and then I also and, and when they were written, and also ask the question of how does history and theology interact. And uh, we'll cover that next time as we kind of break our way into the book of Romans. Thank you. This is Dr. Ted Hildebrandt in his New Testament History, Literature, and Theology course, lecture number 22, on the book of Acts, the second and third missionary journeys, of the Apostle Paul.